Vagrants Vedas. Vagrants Vedas is going to be interesting. That he is the son of a whore. Very auspicious. That he did give up his freedom, his liberation, and live in hell so as to bring relief to suffering sentient beings. That he gets respect for this, even from himself. That he is a perfectionist in falling the world. That he had about 10 minutes of peace in 40 fucking years. That he never, never forgets the suffering here. That he will come back as many times as he has asked. That he loves his guru that much. Did you know that he is, let's see, did you know? Vagrant isn't drinking. Vagrant isn't drinking water. He isn't doing his sadhana. He is eating bread and smoking cigarette butts. Drinking coffee, saying fuck every 10 minutes. His body feels like shit. The moon makes him twitch. Manny is dead and he envies him. Depressed? You betcha. He abuses his body and ignores his sadhana out of juvenile arrogance. He needs to learn to live. He needs to learn some very simple shit that others take for granted. Then he can teach for what it's worth. List of excuses, bipolar insanity. Beam me up, Scotty. This planet sucks. Nicotine Jones, gutter dirtbag with a chip on his shoulder, acid casualty, born to lose shopping cart in his future. Isn't sharing fun? Sick of it yet? Exhausted? This shit never stops with me up and down. Being a dirtbag is a defense. You can't lose what you don't have. You don't have to give if you don't have anything. He is a child of God, literally. He is. That is his only family. He is upset with God, resentful, feels betrayed. Weed withdrawal. Omani Padnam Hom 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 I just want to live the life I please. I don't want no enemies. I do. You can only give the amount of love you're willing to receive. To do is to choose not to hate. We are all eternal, stable, and consistent. In our true state, no death, no suffering, no separation. We retain, we retain individuality only in the good ways as diverse effulgence of light. There are no limits to creativity, the expression of love and light. We are all in it for eternity together. Everything will be okay because everything is okay. The body is only a symbol of separation. Perception equals fair? I'm not sure. The body becomes a symbol of transcendence when we choose love we can't be crucified we can't be oppressed we can only think perceive that we are death and hate and fear and illusions every one is equal we are all dealing with the exact same condition we are symbols of separation hell when we reject each other and we are symbols of unity when we choose love reject hate and fear everything that he has been called a saint. Did you know that? That he has been called a saint and a bodhisattva by people who fucking know? That he is one of the top visionaries on this fucking mud ball that his spiritual name given by the top fucking Mahatma in India means one that is illuminated, one that is over, one who overcomes everything? As far as he knows, he is the only one who has been given that very special name. The others are also stuck in imprisoned torture bodies that also restrict them. The others are stuck in the savage garden that they are in the same prisons. It's time to understand this. They are all lost children. Know them as self. Cling to them. Serve them. They are suffering kids. This should be enough to love them and self. Love yourself. Issue a world without issue. A world without love. Why? We turn from love. Not cause we're bad, just because we got confused. We are created by love in its image. 
Love is light. Love only extends, illuminates. Love can't be split. If it doesn't extend, it's not love. Reality. Everyone, then, is a child of light. And just like its creator, love does not destroy. That's why we're still here. That's why hope springs eternal. Unconditional love and constant creation is our true state forever. Time is also an illusion. That is a projection of our misperception. Perception is a condition of separation. We weigh one thing, one person against another. We choose one and reject the other. That is the world we have made and the only solution is unconditional love. We don't even have to love because that is our natural condition. All we have to do is choose not to hate. The war is over as soon as we realize that war is impossible. Who wrote these words? Who is this person? Who is Vagrant? And why did he write on pieces of trash? Well, Vagrant is dead. Vagrant jumped off a bridge and killed himself. He, um, this is in Santa Cruz. And, um, I had a lot of friends in Santa Cruz and houses that I lived at. And uh, one of these houses, one of these friends took in a semi-homeless who called himself vagrant. He called himself an acid casualty. My friend at the time was 19, 20, maybe 21. And this guy was like around 40. He was all tatted up. He had lived a rough life. He had that body where like, he wasn't a bodybuilder, but you can tell he had done physical stuff all his life and he was always in decent shape. Leathery, tatted skin, just a bunch of like weed tattoo, like uh, prison type tattoos. Some of them were from prison. He was a white dude, but he was like a roughneck. Uh, he just he, he looked like a mean character, um, but he was he was a very he was like a a um, junkyard dog with a heart of gold. Um, so my friend, she's she was a woman. She's she's very intuitive about people, and she did she felt safe with this guy and. She would always see him. He was working at a gas station. He would get these odd jobs. Not real jobs, but people would pay him to do this or that. Santa Cruz is a place where, um, just like Venice Beach, California, you can be homeless and, and, and still have like a decent life. Um, there's a lot of social services. It's a beautiful place. The weather never gets too cold. So um, they started talking, and she was like, you know, you could come crash over at my place some. Um, so sometimes he would stay on the couch. Um, eventually, he pitched a pagoda in the backyard. Um, her landlord didn't like it too much. But she had roommates, so it wasn't just her by herself, and she had a boyfriend too, who was a little sketched out by it. But um, yeah, so there are like three people in the house, her and her roommates, and then there's and we call him Vagrant. Um, I would come by and I would see Vagrant, and um, I got to know him. I didn't get any sketch vibes from him, so I I, I thought it was interesting, kept an eye on it. But um, he uh, he I mean he he eventually started liking her, started telling her how much he loved her, but she put up you know I got a boyfriend and you know we're not we're we're never gonna do that. So she put the boundaries and respected the boundaries. But he would write stuff like this, and he um, he took a lot of acid. He called himself an acid casualty because he, uh, let's see, 40, early 2000s, so he was born in the 60s, 70s, no, early 2000s, 60s, so maybe 65. So he was, um, yeah, in the 70s, he was a teenager dropping acid and partying and stuff. I'd have to look up when Marilyn Man not Marilyn Manson, Charles Manson. He was, um, he had a bunch of stories about up and down California, lived in Big Sur, going to Mexico. She's really the person who would tell the story, but um, a little bit more of a private individual than I am. Uh, so you'll have to uh, suffer through my poor interpretations of the stories I've heard. Um, he lived in Baja, California for a little bit, lived in Mexico for a little bit, drove buses, did tours. Um, always a bunch of drugs, always a, like just basically a burnout. Um, I think he was working on a house in Big Sur and he found some old tapes from the Manson family. And this is Charles Manson was um, trying to be a musician before he decided to create a cult that would go on and kill celebrities and um, try to spark the new racial war, uh, or like global racial war, whatever his idea was or his supposed idea because you have to get stories about him interpreted through the people who are prosecuting him who had their own agendas. But um, but this guy had tapes from, from them. So he had like all these little bits of like 
cultural history just like that he had lived and like these little detritus um, and then that stuff which is like he spent some time in the um, in the squalor of India some some of these guys especially back in that generation felt like they had to go to India to get seek their spiritual path there was like this great awakening for like the beetle who went to India and stuff and so they went to um, India to seek some spiritual counterbalance to like our Western culture which we don't really we talk about much but that was a, there was a big rejection the counterculture of the 60s and 70s was a big re rejection of western culture and western ideals and like um, there's this documentary I saw where um, the people in India thought that we had a famine because there's so many westerners coming out there they thought it was like the Irish potato famine they thought wow it must be really bad in the west if all the children are coming out here seeking a better life but we were just seeking um, not we but they from what I gather were seeking alternative models to interpret the world spiritual models um, I can tell you to get a job I can tell you to you know clean your room and govern your life but we need more than that we need values and foundations and for those of us that Christianity just doesn't cut it and those myths don't cut it uh, we, we look to the East and um, right now I'm, uh, I'm exploring Zen Buddhism and I've always really liked Alan Watts and people like uh, Vagrant um, I mean it's all the same Zen Buddhism comes from Buddhism which comes out of India which just traveled into China and then got mixed up with Tao. And um, Zen itself is uh, comes from Zazen, which I think comes from, it comes from like a, a words that came out of a Buddhist uh, tradition. So it's a form of Buddhism. It's just, it's, it's a form that doesn't respect any of the traditions and feels like you always have to reinterpret um, and that your spiritual path should be sincere and spontaneous, which, you know, a lot of artists and a lot of, a lot of art and a lot of athletics use principles from Zen as far as flow and sincere spontaneous um, states in order to achieve this uh, doing without trying, this getting out of your own way. So the principles of Zen are um, in the principles of execution a lot, um, whether whether you people acknowledge it or not. But um, but yeah, uh, Vagrant was heavy in that Indian tradition, the deep tradition, and that's why I call this Vagrant's Vedas, because the Vedas were the sa a sacred ancient texts out of India out of which then like I think Buddhism was built on and stuff um, so this has some of those ideas like this chant um, some of the wording some of the you know the um, and then you also could tell that this is a mentally unstable person and that's why he killed himself he um, so wrapped up in Vagrant's story is that my friend eventually you know she was going through a tough time in a relationship I think she was breaking up with her guy she was like, I can't deal with your shit right now, man. And um, you need to get out of here for a little bit. You need to get out of my house. And so he did. He respected her enough that like she put up the boundaries and he was like, okay, I'm going to. But like, where did he go? He went on the street. And then he was mentally unstable, bipolar, whatever, um, too much acid. When you're, when you're messing with psychedelics, you're, you're playing with your sanity. And then when I do psychedelics, I respect them on the way in. And on my way out, I try to contextualize them. And I really make sure my feet are back down on the ground. Um, I used to, when I was younger, recommend everyone should do psychedelics. I don't do so much do that anymore. Um, it's a personal practice. It's like skydiving. It's like that flight suit where you put on that suit and you fly down the mountain. It's like there's a point at which you're going to exceed your capability and you're going to smash into a tree. Those guys um, have a very high mortality rate because of that. And the same thing with your, your brain, I think. Um, you uh, can exceed your capability. I, I, the flight suit probably is more dangerous. I, I talk to a lot of people who have uh, healthy experiences long term with psychedelics, so I, I think that's a lifelong practice you can keep. The flight suit, you you do it for a little bit, and then you probably want to stop because eventually, like, it's just it's it's, it's taking on a lot of risk in life. I think the the mortality and in, in, in those types of recreations are, are insane. And but we don't stop people from doing them, and that's pretty much that's like the case for psychedelics. It's like we let people jump off of mountains in a suit that just barely slows your descent, you're not gonna let them stick their finger in their brain and poke around. But um, that might have triggered some of his mental illness. Um, when she kicked him out, she, uh, she said, I just can't deal with your shit right now. He tried to get himself checked into a center. Um, they said that he's not crazy enough. And um, so he started, I think he, um, it was raining that day and he, he sat in the middle of the road and he shit himself and he started rubbing the shit on him so that they would check him in. Um, and that's kind of, it's a tough place to be in in a society where you're too crazy to be among the sane and you're too sane to be among the crazies. 
and that's where Vagrant was. If you read this, it's like he's lucid, and that's why they kept him in the house because he was he was a lucid teacher, and he cleaned he cleaned the house, and he got high with them, and he, he spoke his spiritual shit because he had lived in the slums of India. He had met when he says, what does he say? Did you know that he was um, given the name? Uh, what is it? He was given the name from a teacher in India, but they recognized his spirituality over there. He was called the Bodhisattva, which in um, Buddhism is a um, being who like uh, is very sensitive being who's supposed to lessen the suffering of everyone else and help us get out of these karmic circles. And so people recognize his sensitivity and his high level of spirituality over there. He just um, he was also a party kid and he was a scene kid. And um, yeah, this is um, this reminds me a lot. Yeah, they gave him a name of the, the illuminated one. Um, and I think that's what he, um, I think he put a lot of pressure on himself for not living up to his spiritual potential because um, he, 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 he could have been a teacher. Um, it requires not just the inherent ability, but um, like he had inherent ability, inherent knack for spirituality and for connecting with people, for translating these spiritual ideas and thoughts. And he was very, I, that's why I recognize with him, just like you sense the, the guy had presence. He not only was a scary looking street dude who called himself Vagrant and dipped and was just like a mean looking motherfucker, he was also like had a huge heart. Once some guys were messing with my friend, just came over, some dudes that she didn't want over at her house. And uh, she told him, she was like, I don't really like these guys here, but I don't know how to tell them to leave. And he just kind of like pushed them out with his energy. He didn't tell them to leave. But like, you know, those people who kind of like, if you're on the wrong side, they let you know. And then you kind of like know to give them space. He was that type of dude. He could just kind of push people away with his presence. Um, but no one was there for him. And when he says he was the son of a whore, I mean, he didn't have a good family life. And when she said she couldn't keep with him anymore, he tried, he knew he wasn't good on his own. He tried to go in to get help. Uh, we don't have those facilities in California since uh, Reagan shut them down. Um, Reagan was, this is how it all ties back to politics. Uh, instrumental in closing down a lot of our public health services and after Reagan I'm told that um, a lot of we, we had a lot more homeless a lot more crazies on the street Skid Row in LA blew up and everything and um, he went to a bridge in, in Santa Cruz and he jumped off the bridge and they called my friend and they said that uh, they think that uh, who called maybe a family member someone called her and she just knew exactly what happened she went his body was uh, wasn't even Externally, you can't see anything was wrong. He must have snapped his neck when he fell or something. But he just he jumped off of something tall into the brush and died instantly. Um, his body was like totally not bloated or anything. She says he looked like he was sleeping. But, you know, they pull back the sheet. You start recognizing the tattoos. You know exactly what's going on. Um, and that's why I thought these are important. Because he, he's a guy who fell through the cracks. And um, he wasn't violent. But this is what we're dealing with as a society. The people are slipping through the cracks. Now, some of them are violent. And some of them are doing these shootings. Some of them are creative, like me. And some of them are just quitting, starting and stopping our, our lives. I go to college, I quit. I go to the army, I quit. I started real estate, I quit. It's so like some of us are uh, vagrant. Um, he's just not joining. But um, you have the normal track and you have the others. And I think the solution to what ails us as society lies in that other group, in that creative minority. Uh, and he's, he's definitely a part of that. And I respect that, and I respect his life and um, how good he was to friends of mine. Um, me personally, with people like this, I don't have as much patience, so I respect it. But you know, I just sometimes with like some of my female friends, like in, in New York, with their boyfriends and stuff, I'm like, you know, I'm not I'm not your boyfriend's friend because that's not my job. He's he's your boyfriend. He's your friend. I'm just here to keep an eye on them. So some of us dudes are just like, I'll just I'm just here to keep an eye on that dude just in case he acts stupid. So I never really got close to this guy because in my mind he was still like a street guy. But then he commits suicide and then you have a different interpretation when you realize just how much he was suffering. Um, and he was suffering a lot. This is a story of mental illness. It's also, it's a little bit of a cautionary tale when you want to go down those rabbit holes. When I'm over here and I'm, I'm doing this art and when I watch that movie, um, The Devil and Daniel Johnson, and if you want to be a uh, an artist who just puts their whole life into their art and just you, you want to just want to be creative. It's like, it's like a, it's like a drug. Like these manic episodes. Like, um, I mean, these people. I don't want to trivialize it because they're actually genetically probably um, have an imbalance. 
but um, there but for fortune go your eyes how I feel like there's a Phil Oak song about that um, I how do I identify with vagrant I, I didn't do the choices he did in life and I don't think I have the brain chemistry that he has but I respect his sincerity and I think with a little bit more guidance he could have maybe attached some scholarliness to that curiosity and interest he has. He has this interest in curiosity. I mean, he was. He actually read some really deep books on like left-handed sutras or a lot of what I knew at the time, I have to look back into it. And this is like 10 years ago or so, but in our circle, our interest of like Indian mysticism was coming from this guy who was living at this house. And when we'd hang out with him, he would just tell us shit that we'd never heard before. And we went to Santa Cruz, me and uh, this girl and in our circle of friends, we, were, we weren't from Santa Cruz, we came from Southern California, some of us, and um, he, uh, yeah, he opened up our mind at that formative years when we're stepping outside of Christianity and getting these other ideas and concepts in our head. And, uh, and he, was, he was another concept. He was, he was something that was hard to categorize, and I feel like his words should live on, not to glorify his, his trouble or his pain or to trivialize it but um, you know just me re reading it right now I think there's something we can that we can get from it